This presentation is about the economic impact that the grid has on electricity customers, and by that we mean all electricity customers, residential, commercial, and industrial. This simulation will show what happens in the case of an outage on the old grid, and then how that outage is handled by the smart grid, and what the smart grid can do to generate significant savings for electricity customers. These savings by electricity users are a major part of the business case supporting the creation of self-healing grids. Now here's what's called a one-line diagram of a typical utility system. These lines represent the main lines, called feeders, that run down the main streets. Typically, these have three wires and big switches like these on them. Now these switches don't measure currents or voltages, don't do any processing, and don't communicate with anything. If you want to operate them, you need to go out and open and close them manually. Now you'll notice that some of these devices are shown on the diagram as closed and colored red, while others are open and shown in green. Now this system includes five substations that provide power to the main feeders. Each feeder is color-coded to match the color of the substation from which it's drawing power. For example, substation 4, which is shown as purple, has a purple feeder coming from it. You'll also notice that some of these feeders seem quite short. They've been stylized here so everything will fit on the screen, and these short lines are there mainly to show that we can draw power from the substations to which they're connected. In a real system, of course, these feeders would be much, much longer. In fact, the only feeder that's drawn out in its entirety is this light blue one coming from substation 2. You'll see that it has 2,000 customers on it. The mix of customers is assumed to be the typical combination of 10% commercial and industrial and 90% residential. You'll also see that the customers are spread out pretty evenly, as is customary, with about 333 customers between each of the devices. Now, this feeder is going to have a short circuit at this location, and we will see how the old grid deals with it. As we do that, we'll keep track of the elapsed time in minutes, the number of customers without power at any point in time, and the cumulative minutes that customers have been out of service. We will also track an index called SADI, which stands for the System Average Interruption Duration Index, which tracks the number of minutes the average customer is out of power. The SADI index, therefore, is equal to the cumulative minutes of interruption divided by the number of customers, which on our feeder is 2,000. We will also keep track of customer costs. So how do customers incur costs as a result of an outage? Well, for residential customers, it could be flooded basements, spoiled food, accidents at intersections where the traffic lights aren't working, or the inability to go to work because it's closed due to the power outage. In the case of commercial establishments, it could be the inability to pump gasoline because the pumps can't run, or to sell things in stores because the cash registers don't work. It could also include the inability of manufacturers to produce things with the power off, or it could be the computer data lost by any of these classes of customers. Now, these costs were drawn from a study done recently by the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory for the U.S. Department of Energy. They base their costs on a few indices which are entered into the Interruption Cost Estimate Calculator, or ICE Calculator for short. For this example, we used the two main indices. One is SADI, the Average Interruption Duration Index, for which we used 140 minutes. The other index is called SAFI, which measures the number of interruptions the average customer experiences in a year, and for that, we used 1.29. These numbers represent the 2011 U.S. national average for these two indices as determined in a survey by the IEEE PES Distribution System Reliability Committee. All right, let's see how the old grid deals with this short circuit. To save time, the animation will run much more quickly than in real time, as you'll see from the clock in the lower left. Now, when the fault occurs, the upstream circuit breaker will open to interrupt the short circuit. It then closes back in, hoping that the short circuit is transient. But in this case, it isn't, and the circuit breaker locks open. Now, once that happens, people start going to their phones to call the utility and tell them what's going on, which is helpful to the utility because, in the old grid, that's how the utility establishes the scope of the outage and helps them identify the device that's at the head of it. Now, once they know that, they can dispatch a crew in a truck. Now, the truck is going to have some trouble. 
because the traffic lights are out, so it will take a little longer to get there. Now, once they do get there, they need to patrol the line. These lines are typically 15 to 20 miles in total length, so it takes quite a bit of driving around to figure out where the problem is. Certainly, if a car hits a pole, the ambulance lights could help, but otherwise you have to drive around, often in the dark, trying to find the problem. Now, once they have found the problem, they can call back to headquarters and tell them where the problem is and the nature of it. Headquarters then has to figure out how to isolate the problem, which is actually relatively easy, as it is only necessary to open all the switches around it. The difficult part is for headquarters to figure out how to get the power back on. So while they're isolating, they're worrying about where is their extra capacity in the substations and the lines that can pick up at least some of the customers who are out of power. Well, after some isolating has been done, headquarters figures that substation 4 does have some capacity and that the line can carry the power. So switch 17 can be closed to bring power back to the people in that segment of line, getting 666 customers back in business. So after 70 minutes, we're down to 1,334 customers without power and we still haven't finished isolating the problem. So we need to open switch 35 to get that done. Meanwhile, headquarters has determined that substation one has enough capacity to pick up some customers, so they instruct the crew to drive over and close switch two. Again, this represents about 666 more customers who can be brought back onto the system, getting us down to 668 customers still without power. Headquarters has also determined switch 36 can be closed to pick up another 334. With that done, we're down to 334 customers out of power. It's taken us over 100 minutes to restore power to all those who can have their service restored, and this is using very optimistic operating times. You can imagine how long it would take to restore power if this were a storm scenario with many outages. Well, at this point, the crew is finally able to go to work on repairing the real problem, the line that's down. We've stopped time here because it, the time it takes to repair the cause of the problem is the same under both the old grid and the smart grid. But you can see that the cumulative customer minutes of interruption are significant. The SADI for this example is 90 minutes, and the customer costs are over $275,000. So, what happens when we make the grid smarter? To examine that, we will use exactly the same system configuration and exactly the same problem location. The only thing different is that we will use smart switches. These switches are able to measure currents and voltages. They also have computing power so they can process the data, and they have antennas and radios so they can communicate with each other. There are also special processors added to the system so the other devices, like the upstream circuit breaker, can join the conversation. In fact, these devices talk to each other all day long so that every device knows how much current is being carried in every segment at all times. They also know what the voltages are all over the system. They know the capacities of the lines, and they know what the substations can handle in terms of customer load. So they're in a position at all times to be able to take action on their own when a disturbance hits the system. As we go forward, take a good look at the devices that are circled. After the circuit breaker locks out, the four devices surrounding the problem location talk to each other and, in a matter of seconds, determine the problem is between them and that all four should open to isolate it just as happened with the old grid, except much, much faster. Then the three open switches know how much load is being carried in each of the segments, how much extra capacity each substation has, and the capacities of the lines. As a result, they can also operate very quickly on their own to restore power for the people that can have it restored. This all happens far more quickly than it takes to describe it. So, we're going to have the same outage. It will be interrupted by the circuit breaker the same as before. In the hopes the fault is transient, the breaker will reclose, but finds the fault is still there, so will lock open. Then the smart devices talk to each other and isolate the fault and close back in to restore power in a matter of just 18 seconds. The smart devices also send a message to headquarters alerting them that there is a problem and where the problem is, so headquarters can dispatch a crew, which obviously can move more quickly because a lot fewer traffic lights are out. The crew then patrols the line, but it has a much smaller line segment to cover, so the patrolling time will be much shorter. They radio back to headquarters when they have found the problem. 
Headquarters already knows the scope of the outage and can quickly give permission for the crew to open the visible safety gaps on each of the four devices surrounding the outage area so the crew can go to work on the root cause of the outage in a safe manner. Now, once the crew has all of these devices open, they'll be able to get to work fixing the problem that started this in the first place. In fact, as you can see, they got to the point of being able to work on the outage in one hour less time than was required in the old grid, which is very important to those still out of power. More important, you'll notice that all of the other numbers are a lot smaller than in the old grid case. In fact, if we compare the numbers, you will see that the cumulative customer minutes of interruption in the smart grid case are about 11% of what they were in the old grid scenario. And therefore, naturally, so is the interruption duration index, SADI. The costs are also quite a bit lower. The reason for the better numbers is that with the smart grid, we got down to 334 customers out of power in just 18 seconds. Well, it took the old grid almost two hours to do that. By doing so, the smart grid cuts electricity customer costs by almost $165,000 for this incident alone. Now recall that the interruption frequency index, SAFI, was 1.29, which means the average customer will see 1.29 outages per year, so the actual annualized savings are even bigger, over $210,000. Of course, this automation isn't free. There were five smart devices added to the feeder and four were added as ties to other feeders. If you use a 30-year life, an 11% cost of capital, and an operations and maintenance charge of 3%, those devices have an annualized cost for this smart grid feeder of about $62,500. Well, that's a pretty good return on investment, spending $62,500 per year to get over $210,000 in savings for those customers on the feeder. Now, some might be wondering, if we had to raise rates to provide this automation, how big of a rate increase would be involved? Well, using the average rates that industrial, commercial, and residential customers pay, if we applied this technique to all feeders, the rate of increase would be about 1.3%. But this distributed intelligence can be applied incrementally and doesn't need to be used across the entire system. So if it were only used on the worst performing feeders, and let's say that was 40% of them, then the rate of increase would be just about one half of 1%. And this does not take into account the utility's operational savings, such as the fewer truck rolls, reduced overtime, and the reduced need for mutual assistance crews that can be used to reduce consumer rates. And so it's pretty clear that there's a very solid business case for implementing smart grid self-healing. The problem is that in many, if not most, regulatory jurisdictions, the business case is not recognized because in determining utility investments, there's often no mechanism to take into account electricity user costs and the savings smart grid investments can deliver to the users. In jurisdictions where only the utility savings are considered in making utility investments, and customer savings are ignored, the result is a solution that is suboptimal from a societal standpoint. Only by considering these electricity customer savings will we be able to realize the full promise offered by the smarter grid.